uh, we're in uh, chapter 2 and verse 10, the section where there is uh, a discourse of wisdom that includes uh, speaking to my son or my sons. Sometimes this is put as God speaking to uh, mankind in that sort of a sense. I don't really think that's the idea. Uh, you seem to have what Solomon is doing of talking with those who are uh, under him in many times, but a lot of times it's just wisdom that's personified uh, that is speaking, and you'll notice that happen repeatedly. We looked the last time starting at verse 10. I'm going to read verse 10 through verse 22 so that we can have the full uh, context of what's under consideration. But when you look at this section, what it really does is talk about how wisdom preserves uh, the one who hearkens to the word of God or the one who hearkens to instruction that's given. But in the other side of that, if one does not, they're destroyed as a result of not hearkening to that instruction. So what you have in the first several verses down through verse 15 are the general principle of that. And then starting with verse 16, you have this case of the seductress or the one who is the strange woman, various uh, translations of that, and an application to the one who does not listen to wisdom and gets messed up in this kind of uh, adulterous relationship. Starting out with verse 10, when wisdom enters your heart and knowledge is pleasant to your soul, discretion will preserve you, understanding will keep you. To deliver you from the way of evil, from the man who speaks perverse things, from those who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice in doing evil and delight in the perversity of the wicked, whose ways are crooked and who are devious in their paths, to deliver you from the immoral woman, from the seductress who flatters you with her words, or who flatters with her words, who forsakes the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. And her house leads down to death and her paths to the dead. None who go to her return, nor do they regain the paths of life. So you may walk in the ways of goodness and keep in the paths of righteousness. For the upright will dwell in the land and the blameless will remain in it, but the wicked will be cut off from the earth and the unfaithful will be uprooted from it. We talked about that first part of going through those things, the one who listens to the instruction of God, that they'll gain that wisdom and discretion and understanding. They'll walk in right paths and be blessed because of that. But the one who's going to go into the way of wickedness, they'll be defeated in that wickedness. It's something where that will be to their detriment if they don't listen to the way of wisdom. And now what happens is you come to the place there in uh, verse 16 to deliver you from the immoral woman. Somebody else have another translation than that that you see? All right, from the strange woman. That is the way that you look at it in, uh, especially in uh, the... Uh, King James, American Standard Version, some of those will use that term. And uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit more. The idea is uh, one that has, uh, I don't know how to say this, a border around her, uh, a crown maybe you would call it. And the idea is she has something that is putting her forward to be someone in some way giving a sign of the kind of person she is, not being one righteous, but different in sort of a way like that. In ancient times especially, those who were prostitutes were known by their clothing and uh, many times by the uh, head ornament of some sort that was put on uh, to display that that's exactly what they are. The next one that talks about from the seductress Anybody have another translation of that? Do what? Adulteress there. Any others? Wayward. Wayward, okay. 
that, uh, that word simply means in a very literal sense, someone who's a strange woman or a foreigner. That's what the word literally means. Now, obviously it's not talking of literal, somebody who's just strange, a real weirdo out there or something like that, or uh, someone who's from a foreign country. But why is that used as a euphemism or as a way of someone who's an adulteress? Go ahead. Exactly. You had someone that was not uh, just a, a stranger in the sense of a foreigner, but strangers to the way of uh, life that Israel had been commanded before God. That they're ones who are foreign to that and uh, therefore serving other gods. And remember, when we talk about idolatry in Old Testament and New Testament times, idolatry always involves in some elements of that, fornication as supposedly that which was seen as an act of worship. They would come to the temple prostitutes, they would have their relations, and that would be somehow propagating that way of evil or the, that false god. And so that was uh, quite literally something where when God talks about them, you've gone after the way of adultery, that not only was a figurative sense, they had turned to another one to be their God, but it was quite literally what they were doing as well because that was always a part of idolatry. And when you have this starting out, here's this woman who is an immoral woman, the one that has given a sign that she is there to uh, be ready to be involved in the sexual sin. She's the strange one, the seductress. Now, what does it describe her like? She flatters with her words. Why that? Why does that go along with adultery or fornication, the sexual sin? Somebody. Do what? To be stirred up to be okay. have participate in sin. Okay. That's still the fashion, whether it be a woman or a man, that flattery that comes along builds them up. It puts a rapport there between two people. It builds a bridge where they can be ones who start to uh, uh, engage in actions that they ought not. Many times it's, well, your husband doesn't get you or your wife doesn't get you, but I really uh, think you're special, all these kinds of things. That kind of flattery is not intended to just tell the way the facts are. It's intended to get something out of one. Flattery is for that purpose of trying to gain something in response uh, for oneself. He says this seductress or this one who's the strange immoral woman who forsakes the companion of her youth. Why? Why would that be a bad thing? Why would that say something just really horrible if there wasn't any problem with divorce and remarriage by God anyway? Obviously, what's the point? When she forsakes the companion of her youth, what should she have done with that companion of her youth? Stayed with him. That should have been the permanent monogamous relationship that would have been there, but when she goes to another, that's the point. This doesn't mean anything if God's okay with all kinds of divorce and remarriage and, well, everything's okay just as long as you uh, finally get one you want and y'all can stay together, great. That's not the point. The point is she forsakes the companion of her youth and what's another part of that? Forgets the covenant of her God. So we're talking about someone who knows the will of God. Now she forgets that covenant. She goes to another one, a stranger, a foreigner. Another, and remember in that, part of that whole thing is a reference to uh, the immorality that was a part of idolatry. 
So she shifted from a way of life that was around having that one man, one woman relationship for life under the covenant of God and keeping with that covenant. When she shifts the one, what does she do? She shifts the other. You notice a lot of times that when somebody decides to forsake marriage as it's designed by God, and they decide to get them someone else or then someone else or someone else, almost always what else do they do? They shift their religious views. That's just something that happens. I've seen that over and over again. I've talked to I don't know how many who started to leave that relationship with the spouse of their youth. And I talked to them and I said, there's no turning back from this. This is going to get worse and worse. Oh, no, no, nothing like that. This is all that there is. I'm going to stay like this from now on. And uh, I'd just rather not be married than be married to him or her. I don't believe it. Even if they mean it, they're not going to do it. Nine times out of ten or far more than that, really. This is something where that is just the first step of what goes down the line. For her house leads down to death. Coming into her in other words, coming into her place, what takes place there? Death. Why? Death is a result of sin. When that uh, death takes place, the idea is in a spiritual sense, she's the place of spiritual death and her paths to the dead. In other words, her path, when you come into her house in that way that she goes, you're going where a lot of dead people have gone before. Others did the same thing. and They came to that end of a spiritual death as a result of going there. None who go to her return, nor do they regain the paths of life. I want you to think about that. Now, does that say it is impossible for the one who strays in the sexual sins to ever be right with the Lord. No, it's like any other proverb. It's a proverb that gives a general rule. The general rule is what? Not that you can do that and be okay. If one tries to fool themselves with saying, well, this is just one act or this is just one time or just one person out here, don't, don't get that kind of fooling of oneself and in the mind. You go to her, you don't ever return to her the way you were. When one becomes uh, a person who gives that sexual bond away, it can never be gotten back. It's been given up. And there is always a memory of that. There's always problems that go with that. And he says, nor do they regain the paths of life. The fact of it is that while there are uh, many sins and that the sexual sins are just one among them, the fact of it is some sins have greater consequences than others. They have a greater problem that comes from that that is inherent. There's a bond that takes place in the sexual union that's meant to be strong. And it has that kind of a, a binding power. Why? Because it's meant to be shared with one person for life. But when that's shared with another and another and another and another, that doesn't get out of the brain. It stays there. There's always someone that knows a private part of you that they can't unknow and you can't get freed from. So what happens? That's always there as a part of it. I've always told young people, don't you think that there can be such a thing as a one night kind of a fling? Doesn't happen that way. What may intend to be a one night fling will be with you in your mind the rest of your life. It'll be with that person. Whatever the stories are that that one tells, they can tell. There's something that's there that changes you. And that needs to be understood about some uh, consequences of the sexual sins 
That's something we need to be very clear with our children about and pointing out. This is serious. This is not just something that you play around with. Now, that's not only so with those who are teenagers. You think that problem ends when you get up into your upper 20s? or upper 30s, or 40s, or 50s, or 60s, evidently. I've seen who are, uh, some who are involved in that at every age of life. Why? Why is that such a disastrous thing in consequences on our life? When you look at these problems of the sexual sins, I've noticed that they, well, there's more than just two, but two main things that I see that cause one to go after that. Uh, one is this recreational use, if I can put it that way. They think this is going to be a fun behavior, it's going to feel good, whatever might be the case there. And uh, that's their approach to it. Another is that they feel some bond. They, they share something with, uh, here some other person that, you know, my wife or my husband, they don't get me, but you do. There starts to be that kind of a thing. Either one of them are ones that when you think about it, we could have stopped at the very beginning because we know it's wrong right there. What God intended the sexual union for and uh, the attraction of it is because it binds two people together. It's something that causes a bond to exist that ought to only be with one. Yes, there are things that are enjoyable about the sexual desires and the fulfillment in it, but that's what especially takes place in marriage and ought to be left for that and builds a greater bond there. The other thing is, when I'm going out and I'm sharing my problems with somebody other than my spouse, and especially if it's problems within a marriage, I'm asking for trouble. That's just the wrong way to go there. You keep that between yourselves and work it out. Those are the kind of things that uh, we need to think of. When we're looking at the effects of this sin, it's one that we need to recognize this is not just like any other thing. It's just a one-time thing, whatever else. Whatever we might do to minimize the effect, the effects are not minimal. And in almost every case, it's going to be one that's devastating. How many homes and how many children have grown up with problems, parents leaving that home, child thinking it's all my fault when actually what it is is two adults who couldn't act like adults but were like a couple of uh, uh, hormoned up teenagers or something like that. Uh, they need to recognize this is something that uh, is affecting more than just me and you. It's is affecting others who are all around us and I've seen way too much of this to, to look at it lightly and problems that come from it among God's people 
I've seen it wreck congregations, not just families, but various cases like that. That's something we need to be very uh, recognizing of. And also, when you start to go down the path of making light of divorce and remarriage and those kind of things, watch out. Every single church where I've seen that happen, there's been problems that come up in moral lines of couples there. And ultimately, there were problems that came about uh, with the congregation as well, ending up usually splitting. Anybody got anything there? All right, as you go on from that point, he says, so you may walk in the ways of goodness. In other words, leave off this. So that you may walk in the ways of goodness and keep to the paths of righteousness. If we think about what is right or good, that word is uh, that which is virtuous, especially in the moral sense of it, and then righteousness, that which is ordered by God, that which is according to his will. He says uh, that's the way we ought to walk. For the upright, those who follow that path, they'll dwell in the land. What does that mean to dwell in the land? What land are we talking about? Okay. The land of promise there. And the promise from God was what? You'll dwell in the land as long as what? You keep the covenant. When you forsake the covenant, what happens? I'll throw you out, just like I did the ones before you. So the idea is that you live long in the land. A lot of times you'll see that. It has to do with that. There's another one, though. When one was involved in adultery or fornication, what was the law with regard to that person? Stoned to death. So you won't live long in the land if you do that, is the point. If you do what God says, you have a length of life. You can go on with that. You'll be a blessing to others as well. But when you don't, there are serious consequences. There is a physical kind of a way in which God illustrated the fact that the wages of sin is death. And for adultery and several others, that way was that uh, you die then. The stoning took place. He says, but the wicked will be cut off from the earth. There's a euphemistic rep, uh, representation of that itself. To be cut off from the earth means you aren't living on the earth anymore. Why? Because you've been put under uh, as a result of your sin. And the unfaithful will be uprooted from it. That's the idea pulled out of the land. That you're taken from it. And that was the result of people who, when they would go on and forsake God's law, forsake his covenant, sooner or later, that led to them being taken away from the land of Palestine. God no longer had it given to them. Anybody got anything else there? Anybody? Okay, let's look at a few questions on this one. Is God's wisdom something we can never know in a practical way? No, I see a lot of heads shaking this way. Why not? Exactly. All of these are practical points on God showing us, yes, you can know wisdom, and you can live in that way. You can understand it. What New Testament passage fits the principle found in chapter 1 in verse 31? In 1 in verse 31, the statement is, Therefore they shall eat the fruit of their own way and be filled to the full with their own fancies. Talking about those who are evil. Okay. Okay, you reap what you sow. What else? The basic point is the same thing as you have in Romans 3, isn't it? The wages of sin is what? Death. Death. Or you take other passages that have that same kind of a point. The idea of what takes place from uh, that which is the uh, fruit of the Spirit versus that which is of evil. You look at those. You have the same thing pointed out there as well. All right. Next one. Let me see which one I want. 
How does discretion watch over you and understanding keep you? Okay. Anybody else there? Okay, that's uh, one that repeatedly that discretion watches over us and understanding keeps us. God's way teaches us wisdom. It teaches us that which is in the proper order and knowledge of things. And when we do that, uh, they are the ones that lead us to the best way of life. It says... In what sense is the one who succumbs to the enticements of the strange woman never able to return again? In what sense? All right. All right. You've given away something for good that you can't get back. Next part of that, how do fornication and adultery often ruin one's life in a way that continues beyond the guilt of that sin. There's some real obvious ones. Trust is broken. What else? In the sense of an obvious, your life, what sometimes happens as a result of child is sometimes the result in the case of David, that child was <coughs> brought to death because of the wrong. Sherry had mentioned the diseases that are often associated with that. All right, severing of relationships. The problem of a result of what happens to our children. And uh, we put a kind of an antagonism that's out there from that point on. Go ahead. leads to various things of wrong. And it caused the, and it, it caused the, the enemies of God to blaspheme, uh, to, to talk against it. So it's kind of a lot of, a lot of ripple effects. I know uh, back when this happened, you was a young man, a young preacher, and uh, I had a lot of confidence in him, thought highly of him, and uh, he tried to commit suicide. And we found out the reason was that he had been living a double life. And it was involved in a great deal of problems with prostitution, other things like that. Uh, and he had run up over $100,000 in debt in going down this path. And there was no way in the world that he could get out of that at that point. And so he thought, well, I might as well kill myself. There are so many things that I've seen be a part of this sin and so many devastating effects that it's had that I wish I could get people to recognize before you even think about going down that path. I'd love to talk with you and get you to understand that's the worst thing you can do. I don't know anything else that will mess up your life uh, as badly as that will. And uh, that's something that we need to keep our, our mind on. Anything else there? Go ahead.
part of what I did when I was in Alvin and Baytown, I served as uh, Texas Vice President to uh, Texas Right to Life. And it was with a lot of things going and lecturing in some of the medical schools around uh, Houston area and several other things. And I've talked with several who had messed up their lives, one that used it for several years as just a means of birth control. She didn't even try to keep anything from happening, just abortion after abortion after abortion. She died at 32. Uh, the effects of that, even though they try to tell you there's no problem, it's safe and all that, no it's not. Somebody always comes out dead uh, as a result of abortion in the child. And uh, sometimes the other one dies as well. And the fact of it is, it's murder. Whether it's legal or not, it's the murder of uh, a human being. All right, let's go to chapter three. Chapter three. First six verses, my son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands. For length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. All your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. Now, All, go ahead. Um, can I go back to what we just talked about? No, we don't allow that. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm not saying this that uh, it's right, it's okay, and but I have seen, uh, and I'm saying this because if somebody's in this condition or in this condition at some time in their life, I have seen, you know, uh, unwed pregnancy, um, you know, turn a person's life around, a, a bad be turned into a good, and just something That's beautiful right. just come from it. I'm not saying that so people can go, well, this might happen from this. I'm saying this because if somebody's in that instance today in here or maybe in a month that you know the world's not over if you're in that position I'm no but one needs to right. yes and I recognize that that's always so there's always hope in forgiveness right. and that's that's a fact however there's also consequences of sin that go on beyond that yes. forgiveness Continue and uh, that's something that both sides of that need to be recognized, is that uh, uh, at its best, and forgiveness and putting things behind, I can guarantee you that the person who lives with that on their conscience, lives with that on their mind, worries about a number of things, whether this will come up or whatever else there. You don't need to do that. You know, don't, don't start that path. All right, anything else there? Okay. These first six verses then as Paul, or as, uh, not Paul, this is Solomon. Uh, as Solomon says, my son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commandments. Think about the way that that's stated. Where is it that he's keeping those commandments from? Keeping is doing them, right? But from where? From the heart. He says, don't forget my law. Put it in your mind. The Bible heart, obviously, is in the blood pump we're talking about. It's the mind, the will of man. So you put that into your mind and you remember the law. And then what happens? As that's changed our mind, what happens with our actions? All right, our actions are changed because that's where our heart is. Chapter 4, he's going to talk uh, as a man thinketh in his heart, what? So is he. There's the battle that you're starting with to understand that it's not just a book with 
pages and ink on it that is there of God's word. Yes, it's written down, and he gave us that so that we could have that uh, uh, to study and think on. But where he intends it to get out of is that book and into our heart. And if it hasn't done that, we haven't done with that word what we truly need to do. Uh, sometimes people say, well, you think that all you think is happening is the word is working. Well, just think about that statement for a minute. What does that tell you about their assessment of the value of the word? Words are an expression of the ones who gave them. And the one who gave his word was who? God. All scripture is what? Inspired of God. Now, when I think about these words as being that which are the expression, the thoughts, the values of God, if I put those words into my mind and let that live there, then what happens? Yeah. Somebody turn over to Colossians 3.17, please. Colossians chapter 3, I want you to read verses 16 and 17. Anybody got it? Go ahead. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Okay. Now, the first part of that, think about this. Let the word of Christ what? Dwell in you richly. So it's not just be there, it's there in abundance. Now, that's put into effect in our singing. When we sing, how are we to sing? All right, we sing and make melody with the heart. So there's a singing that we're doing in that way overtly, these words, the notes, but what's being harmonized with? With our heart. That heart is expressing that heartfelt uh, devotion and uh, response to God of praise and glory. All right, now what happens in verse 17? And what? Whatever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see the point in that? It's not just, here's our principle, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. It's not just the singing that's there, that's a manifestation of that. But whatever you do, in word, in other words, in your teaching, or in your action, in your practice, do all in the what? Name. You're subjecting yourself to the name or the authority of God. You're doing it in his name because that is who has control or mastery or lordship. You see, the whole point is that when we recognize how God is and uh, how great he is, then it causes us to have a greater respect for his law, his will. That word then is not just pages and ink, that word is an expression of who he is. And that's why we look through that word to guide every step that we take, every word that we speak. You see, that's a point that is made repeatedly, Old Testament and New. Point of it here by Solomon is in saying, look, you do that because if you start out that way, my son, that's the way for you to live life. That's the way for you to be one who's going to be able to have a life that is lived properly in the sight of God. Anybody else there? Okay, go ahead, Aaron.
Every facet, and that's exactly right. Go ahead. When you're talking about uh, the Word of God being God's will, of course, that was one of the things I started talking to him about this before, but it came up to where some of the girls at the school were three. And do not conform to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Right. The change from that old man, the old mind, to the new man with the mind that's after God. All right. He goes on there. He says, now, if you do that, it'll add length of days and long life. Peace will be added to you. Again, a reference not only to the longevity of life that was there by not being uh, put to death as a result of sin, but also in continuance of the land that God would continue to be there. He says, now let not mercy and truth forsake you. I want to hang on that for a minute to, to think about. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Mercy. Oftentimes when we talk about grace and mercy, the difference typically is pointed out, I think rightfully so, that mercy is the attitude. Grace is the action. It's what was done. Because God was rich in mercy, he acted in sending his son to die for us. That's the grace. But without the mercy of God, you would have never had the grace of God. So that mercy, that desire to bring good, that desire to uh, for a, uh, a benefit. He said, let mercy and truth, let not mercy and truth forsake you. What about truth? You have statements that are made. Much of restoration theology, like uh, some of the thoughts of Martin Luther, John Calvin, certainly, and others, their concept was when you have grace or mercy, you have that pitted against truth or law. Their idea was one had to be over the other, that if you just have law and truth, then you're not ever going to have mercy and it's just going to be something that's uh, legalistic that's out there. And so their way of thinking was grace and mercy conquers truth and, uh, and that which is right in the sight of God. That's a false concept because all through the scripture what you see is those two are tied together. You can't have grace without God's truth. You can't have the mercy without the manifestation of his commandments. Uh, over and over again, in fact, the scripture is called an act of mercy. For instance, go over to uh, Titus. Titus chapter 2, the grace of God that appears to all men does what? Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That calls the word of God the grace of God. You have to have those two put together in anything where you divide those and you separate them and say, now wait a minute, I want to have this one, not this one, or that one subordinated. No, sir. You always have both of them, it says, 
You bind them about your neck, write them on the tablets of your heart. Do we need to seek mercy, the benefit of others? Absolutely. Are we to teach about the mercy of God and the grace? Absolutely. If we don't, we've missed it. But let me tell you something. You don't ever teach about mercy and truth or have mercy and grace without teaching about the truth of God and his word. That's where those are found. I wouldn't know anything about God's grace or God's mercy other than what I read in the truth. You can't separate those two. There's some way that brings them together. This idea that would have it as being something where they're put in opposite poles just isn't true. You let the mercy and truth be a part of you. Don't forsake it. Find it around your neck. I mean, look at that. It's always with you, right? Do what? Write them on the tablet of your heart. There's the same thing that he started with in this chapter. Both of those have to be there. It's not a one or the other. A lot of times, that's how error gets its start. If someone will say, well, this has to be over this. Let me tell you something. If they're both true according to God's word and they're both mandatory, then they're mandatory. I don't need to worry about something of saying, well, what takes precedence over what both are essential. You know, it's like trying to say, well, which is the greatest uh, part of these things with regard to the plan of salvation? Well, I might say, which is fundamental? That's what Jesus was asked. What's the greatest commandment of the law? What he said. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Seconds like to it, love your neighbor as yourself. Why? On these two, he said, hang the whole commandment. In other words, I do them through a love of God. That which I have responsibility toward God to do starts with a sense of having a love for God. If I don't have that, I'm never going to be obedient to God. What I have to do in responsibility to my fellow man, where does that come from? If that's not as a result of having a love for my fellow man, then I'm never going to be obedient to that. All right, we're done with time here, it looks like. Uh, who has the closing prayer? Riley. Riley, okay. So we'll go to God in a word of prayer, and we'll start there at the first part of chapter 3 next time. Go ahead, Riley.